This is the SIG storage intro. Uh, I'm going to be talking about what SIG storage does, who we are, how you get involved. Um, so anything that you want to find out about SIG storage, this is the place to be. At the end, we're going to do a panel with some of the folks who've been uh, involved with SIG storage for a while. Um, to get to know uh, you folks, uh, by a raise of uh, hands, how many of you uh, know what SIG storage is? All right, that's good. How many of you have participated uh, in a SIG storage meeting or contributed code or anything like that? OK. And uh, all right, that's, uh, that's, that is what I was expecting. Uh, so let's get started. First up, uh, who is SIG storage? SIG storage is a group of Kubernetes contributors. If you're not familiar with what a SIG is, a SIG is a special interest group. Kubernetes is a very large project. So we divided, uh, divided it up into smaller groups. Uh, and these groups are responsible for sub-areas of Kubernetes. The Kubernetes uh, uh, special interest group for storage specifically is responsible for the block and volume layer, uh, specifically ensuring that file and block uh, storage is available in a portable manner to your containers wherever they're scheduled. Um, so the scheduler, scheduler is responsible for uh, scheduling a pod. Uh, the kubelet is responsible for starting a pod. Our team is responsible for ensuring that any persistent or uh, ephemeral uh, local or remote storage that that pod depends on is available to that pod. So this includes things like dynamic provisioning of volumes, uh, attaching a volume to a given node, uh, mounting that volume into the container, uh, resizing now snapshots and all of these volume and storage related operations. So. We started off with a uh, just existing within the core Kubernetes code base. Uh, this was when the project first started. But as we continued to grow, what we realized is that we were adding more and more third-party code into the core of Kubernetes. And uh, that was becoming unsustainable for a number of reasons, including the fact that we couldn't actually test this external code. So you can imagine third-party um, you know, cloud provider storage plugins like AWS or GCP plugins, uh, and even you know, uh, things like NFS and iSCSI or Fiber Channel, uh, these volume plugins that existed in, in the core of Kubernetes, we really had no way of testing it, but we were responsible for maintaining them. Uh, and since that was becoming unsustainable, we created uh, interfaces to allow external development of these volume plugins. Uh, an initial attempt at this interface was something called Flex Volumes, and a more recent and uh, the, the thing that we're going to be moving forward with is called the container storage interface. So both of those are also under the purview of this group. The container storage interface just achieved its 1.0 milestone last quarter, uh, and we just uh, pushed it to GA in Kubernetes 1.13. Um, so some of the uh, components in the Kubernetes API that this team is responsible for include persistent volume claims and persistent volume storage classes, which are responsible for dynamic provisioning, and of course the uh, interfaces that I just mentioned, including CSI, uh, Flex, and pretty much all the volume plugins that you can find within Kubernetes. Uh, that's our team page. If you're interested in getting involved, that uh, that is where you're going to find more information about the team. Uh, the Storage SIG uh, hosts meeting, meetings every two weeks, and we have folks showing up from a very diverse set of backgrounds. Uh, that includes storage vendors, that includes uh, cluster orchestrators, uh, and uh, everything in between. Um, so you're welcome to join. Uh, and if you do join, what would you be working on? Well, the storage SIG works on, number one, we code new features. Uh, we write tests. We fix bugs, uh, all related to the volume and storage subsystem. So that could be as part of the core, you know, the controllers that uh, operate to make, to bind volumes or to uh, attach a volume or to make it available on a, on a particular container. Um, or external of Kubernetes, Kubernetes. Now with the container storage interface, a lot of our code is no longer actually part of Kubernetes, Kubernetes. We have a lot of sidecar containers that we're responsible for maintaining uh, that pair with external CSI drivers. So if you're a third-party vendor who's writing a storage driver, you could do it completely on your own using the interfaces that exist. But to make it easier, this team actually provides a set of sidecar containers that will do things like interact with the Kubernetes API and issue CSI calls against your driver. So it minimizes the overhead of writing new drivers. 
Um, so there's a lot of uh, uh, work going on uh, with those sidecar containers and then of course kind of end-to-end -end testing all of these things to make sure that they work the way that we expect them to. Uh, Kubernetes of course is becoming a fundamental base infrastructure layer for a lot of people across the world and it, uh, it has to be stable above all. It has to be reliable. Uh, we can't have bugs in it and so a lot of the focus moving forward is going to be on uh, reliability and uh, making uh, uh, just improving what we have rather than continuing to add more code. Uh, we do host uh, these uh, virtual meetings every two weeks on Zoom, so if you're interested in attending, please look at uh, the uh, team page. Uh, we also host face-to-face -face meetings every now and then. Uh, we're in fact hosting a small face-to-face -face meeting tomorrow here at KubeCon. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. Uh, and then uh, the community is pretty active on both Slack and the Google group. Um, so if you're uh, interested in reaching out to folks, that's a good way to do so. Um, so what have we been working on? Uh, some of the recent achievements of this group uh, for the most recent Kubernetes release, we moved uh, CSI to GA, as I mentioned. Uh, we also moved raw block volumes to beta. So, so far prior to this, the primary Kubernetes volume plugin interface was file-based. Uh, that meant that if you had uh, some sort of block uh, a device that was available uh, for your containers, the driver would first format a file system on there and expose that as uh, a mounted directory. Uh, with this functionality, the raw block device can actually be exposed directly inside the container, uh, which is useful for certain types of databases that are optimized for, uh, for using raw block instead of uh, mounted file systems. Um, now, what's interesting is that as we become more decoupled, uh, where you have core Kubernetes code as well as external CSI code, uh, functionality gets added to the core and then it follows into CSI. So while the core functionality for raw block was moved to beta this quarter, the CSI implementation of raw block is still alpha. And so we're hopefully going to move that next quarter to beta and uh, those are kind of on a staggered timeline. Uh, the next feature here is topology-aware volume scheduling. Uh, this is a uh, functionality that allows the Kubernetes scheduler to be aware of what the structure of the storage system looks like in terms of availability. Um, you know, in some storage systems, a volume may not be available to all the machines uh, equally within a cluster. So you can imagine in a cloud environment, for example, a given volume may only be available to a specific zone. Uh, and so it's important for the scheduler to be aware of this so that it can make appropriate scheduling decisions. You don't want a pod landing on a uh, VM that exists in a zone where it can't access that volume. Um, so what we wanted to do here was come up with uh, a mechanism that doesn't incorporate or like hard code the concepts of zones and regions and other topology primitives. Instead, we wanted to create something generic that can apply not just to cloud providers, but <laughs> Uh, you know, some sort of any type of on-prem uh, topology that might exist. Uh, you can imagine racks or even nodes. Um, so that work uh, has moved to stable GA uh, in the Kubernetes core. On the CSI side, that implementation is still alpha and is uh, going to be moved to beta hopefully next quarter. Moving forward, uh, looking into 2019, some of the features that we're going to be working on, one is the migration of entry volume plugins to CSI. So we created this awesome new interface to write volume plugins, but we have a set of old volume drivers that are built into the core of Kubernetes. Each one of these old drivers exposes a interface, a Kubernetes API interface, uh, and so therefore it is uh, the Kubernetes deprecation policy applies. And the Kubernetes deprecation policy is very strict. It's basically that you can't really deprecate an API object until the next major release of Kubernetes, which is Kubernetes 2.0, which is basically forever. We're stuck with the API that we have. So we have these set of volume plugins that expose, for example, GCPD, AWS, EBS in the Kubernetes API. They have code in the core Kubernetes, Kubernetes that implements those drivers. We now have an external mechanism with CSI to implement drivers. We're asking folks to start implementing CSI drivers, and what we'd like to do is start proxying the Kubernetes API to use CSI drivers as the implementation rather than having that code living uh, within the core. Uh, that project is uh, very large, and we need to do it very carefully because the success metric 
is a little bit strange. We just need to make sure that nobody notices uh, that we <laughs> swapped it out underneath them, because if they do, we have failed. Um, the plan is to take that to alpha in Q1, uh, beta in Q2, and GA in Q3. It is a massive amount of effort, uh, and uh, we're still trying to decide if we're going to 100% pursue this path. So there's a small possibility that we might decide to do something else. Uh, the other things uh, that we're going to be pursuing in the next year are uh, bringing uh, CSI up to feature parity with the core um, so that we can do the migration. So this includes raw block volumes, topology, resizing, and inline volumes. Uh, and then beyond that, uh, we are also looking into the next generation of primitives to introduce into the Kubernetes API. So for things like data management operations like snapshotting and cloning. Uh, we already have a implementation uh, within CSI for snapshotting that is currently alpha. Uh, but it is very basic in that it allows you to create a snapshot and restore it to a new volume. Um, some of the functionality that we'd like to add is the ability to, for example, QS your workload based on uh, the snapshot. So we would send a signal to the pod to say, hey, we're about to take a snapshot. Please pause, take the snapshot, and then resume the workload so that we can get an app, uh, at least a pod level consistent uh, snapshot. Uh, and then taking that to the next level, uh, if we could come up with some mechanism to be able to actually snapshot an application, uh, that would be pretty cool. But there is uh, hurdles in the way in terms of Kubernetes doesn't have a first class way to represent an application right now, and we need to define that. Um, so this team is also going to be working with the uh, SIG uh, application to try to figure out what the hooks are to make sure that we have a nice end to end story there. Um, so how do you get involved? So if any of this sounds interesting to you and you want to get involved, uh, again, please go to the SIG storage uh, page. All the information about how to get involved is there. Uh, we have the biweekly meeting. Uh, this meeting is used to organize the work that we do in this group. Uh, we have a, uh, a spreadsheet that we track all the work in. And at the beginning of every quarter in one of these meetings, we'll do a planning session uh, where we decide what we're going to commit to for the next quarter and who's going to be working on what. And then in each subsequent meeting throughout the quarter, we'll do status updates to figure out uh, you know, for all the things that we've committed to, how far along is it, what's remaining, are we still going to be able to deliver it for that quarter, or do we need to push it out to, uh, to another quarter? Um, don't feel intimidated. Please uh, jump in and just listen if you want to. Uh, get comfortable. And then if there's something that you would like to discuss, feel free to modify the agenda document and throw something in there that you'd like to discuss. Uh, where do you begin? A good place to begin is bugs. We have a lot of them. Uh, so I checked yesterday. There were 275 open bugs in the core Kubernetes, Kubernetes related to SIG storage. Uh, of course, some of these might be duplicates, and uh, they need to be triaged. But there is considerable amount of work just figuring out what the status of uh, all of these bugs is and what has been fixed, what hasn't been fixed. And of course, there are a ton of external components that we now own, uh, which are going to have their own set of bugs and issues as well. Um, help us write tests. That is uh, you know, the, the, the biggest focus uh, next quarter. I, I would like to just focus on stability. Um, so if you can help us uh, improve uh, testability of our infrastructure, that would be awesome. Uh, Michelle here has been working with the community to um, come up with a framework where you can write a test and have the volume plugin be uh, pluggable. So whether it's entry or CSI or whatever driver it is, the actual test exercising that driver would be the same within uh, Kubernetes, and you can run it against any type of driver. And there's been a lot of work to enable that, which has allowed us to scale the number of end-to-end -end tests that we have. But there's still a lot of work left to be done there. Uh, and then Michelle will come up in a little bit, and maybe we can ask her more about that. Uh, and then, of course, you can also help us write features. Um, we do have a lot of feature work that's going to happen as well, probably closer to the second half of next year, uh, mostly around snapshots and data management and things like that. Uh, if you're interested in the Kubernetes release schedule, take a look at that link. It's uh, under SIG release. Um, the next big release is going to be 1.14 for the Q1 uh, for the first quarter of next year. Uh, I mentioned the SIG storage planning spreadsheet, which we use to keep track of work. Um, and uh, for the, the, the way that you propose a feature in Kubernetes is you have to have a uh, feature opened against Kubernetes slash features, which announces that I have this feature that I want to build for this release. And it kind of acts as a central point for everything that is going to be required to ship that feature. So you'll link out to things like the design doc, 
the documentation that you're going to need to write for it. And this is what the release team uses to keep track of the feature as it goes through its development process. Uh, and if SIG storage uh, basically approves this as something that we want to work on for the quarter, we're going to put the SIG storage label on there and track it as part of the work that we're doing for the quarter. Um, you're here at KubeCon. There is a strong uh, a presence here for, uh, from the SIG storage. Uh, yesterday, we had an all-day cloud-native storage day. Uh, there were a number of talks related to storage, uh, and uh, this event was oversubscribed. I think there was space for 100, and 300 were on the wait list. Um, and then earlier this morning, unfortunately, you already missed this one, but uh, Michelle gave an excellent talk, uh, Michelle and Jan here, uh, on some of the security issues that we uh, encountered with the storage layer and how security is handled overall in the Kubernetes project. Uh, that talk is going to be uh, posted online soon, so you can keep an eye out for that. Uh, and then uh, moving forward, uh, there is a talk by Jared Watts on adding a new storage provider to uh, Rook, uh, which is an uh, operator for uh, Ceph. Uh, there is another talk that I failed to add on here, which is by David Zhu, uh, and it is titled, uh, David, can you give us the title if you're around? How I, uh, how I Manage to Trust the Spec, uh, I believe it's something like that. But it, basically, it's about uh, the CSI specification and how specifications allow for better uh, collaboration and extensibility, and that's going to be tomorrow. And finally, there is a face-to-face -face meeting tomorrow morning uh, between 9 AM and uh, noon. It's a mini face-to-face -face meeting. We're going to get all the folks in the SIG storage together uh, just to discuss uh, various issues. Uh, we find that the biweekly meetings are great for keeping track of status, but if you ever want to do like deeper design discussions, either we set up a separate Hangout uh, virtual call for that, or the best thing is just to set aside a couple of days to discuss things. Uh, and in this case, since a lot of us were going to be present at KubeCon, we decided let's take this time to just have a mini face-to-face -face meeting and. We'll spend a few hours tomorrow morning just uh, talking through um, various designs and things like that. So if you're interested in that, uh, please reach out, uh, and I'll uh, pass along the information. It's going to be at the Renaissance Hotel tomorrow morning. All right, so if I could ask uh, you folks to step up, Jan, Shing, Michelle, Hamant. Uh, these are some of the uh, veteran members of uh, SIG Storage. And uh, they can uh, help me answer questions. And maybe I'll ask uh, Michelle the first question, uh, which is, <laughs> let me see if it's turned on. I'll let you figure that out. I think you might need to turn it on. What are we doing uh, about uh, testability and improving the stability of the volume uh, uh, subsystem? Excellent question, Saad. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in the past, the way that we tested volume plugins in Kubernetes is we create, in our test case, we create the pod, and we actually specify the exact volume type we want. So if you want to test GCEPD, you create a test with your pod that creates a GCEPD volume. And at least for us, we were pretty good at adding our test cases. So GCEPD is really well tested. But all the other volume types that don't run on GCE are not. Um, so a big effort that um, we have been doing over the last two quarters is to try to refactor the way that we run our tests so that we can separate the test case itself from the underlying volume. And um, with this, you can basically write one test case and, and the test case is testing things from the user's perspective. So the test case is something like, can I mount a volume, write to it, and when the pod restarts, can I read the data again? And the test case says nothing about what the underlying storage is. That part is abstracted away and can get plugged in. And now what our framework can do is it iterates through all our supported volume plugins and just runs the same test case against every single volume. And that has uncovered some funny issues, like some test cases actually work on PD, and they end up failing on NFS for some strange reason. Maybe there's a bug. Um, so that's been really good. We probably went from like 10 test cases to 100 test cases um, in the last two quarters, and we're pushing the 
uh, limits of the CI <laughs> with all our test cases now, but um, that's a pretty, um, I guess, I guess we're not quite there yet. The eventual end goal is to be able to provide a library with a bunch of test cases and you can import those into your CSI drivers and run our standard library of test cases against any CSI driver. Awesome, thank you, Michelle. Yes. Uh, so I haven't been following that closely, but um, what is the latest thinking on how to do encrypted at rest storage? Like, can CSI block devices be layered? Do you use vmcrypt? Is it something that you guys are going to do natively? Does anybody want to answer that? Uh, all right, so uh, the way that we think about uh, encryption right now is that it is um, a feature of a storage system. So various storage systems figure out different ways to do storage. And um, we haven't standardized it either in CSI or the Kubernetes API because in general what we try to do is uh, only expose in the API the things that are absolutely required for application developers to interact with storage. Uh, anything that the storage cluster admin is going to be responsible for, we try to expose through opaque parameters in the storage class. So any given driver can expose any number of uh, opaque parameters tuning any knob for that storage system. So you can imagine one of those knobs would be, I want to enable encryption and use this encryption key. So in fact, for GC persistent disks, we're going to be doing exactly that. Uh, and it'll be exposed as an opaque parameter in the storage class. Um, in the future, if we find that uh, that is not sufficient and that the orchestration system, for some reason, needs to be aware of this special property, we might consider extracting that out into a common field in the Kubernetes API and, uh, into CSI. But so far, at least for encryption, I don't think uh, we've seen a big need to do that. So the um, tests under CSI test are testing that your driver implements the spec correctly. Um, it doesn't necessarily test that your CSI driver works in Kubernetes as well as our entry drivers. So they're kind of they're, they're two different things. One's testing that you've um, implemented imp the interface. You've interpreted the CSI spec correctly, like you're returning the right return arguments on certain errors and that kind of thing. Um, whereas the Kubernetes tests are meant to be testing like end-to-end -end functionality uh, using pods and testing data persistence and testing reclaim policies and other Kubernetes specific features. Okay. Cool. Yes. Mm -hmm. Anyone want to take it? So yes, there is a central place. Uh, we have a kubernetes-csi.github.io page where you can find documentation related to Kubernetes-csi. Uh, Kubernetes One of the sub-pages there is a drivers page. Uh, inclusion on that page, of course, is optional, but uh, so far a lot of folks have listed their drivers that are currently available as alpha, beta, uh, and their status. It doesn't uh, list whether or not it passes tests. No. Because we, we don't have, we currently don't have a CSI conformance suite or anything like that, but the eventual end goal is we do have something. So then, like, drivers will, there could be a driver's page with, like, a check mark if they pass the tests. So right yeah. now you just have to trust that the vendor <laughs> tested it themselves. Yes. So mention that we are working on to take the in three drivers. Mm -hmm. Uh, good question. So the question is, uh, you're moving to move the entry drivers out of tree. What about the basics like NFS and iSCSI and those? Um, so I classify it into four sections. One is the cloud provider volume plugins. Uh, those need to go first because we're trying to get the cloud provider code out of core as fast as possible. The second set are third-party remote persistent drivers. So this would be things like, uh, I think there is port works and a handful of others that are in there uh, and uh, they're remote volume plugins managed by third parties so we're going to hand those off to those companies and they'll write a CSI driver and we'll proxy those out. Uh, the third set are the remote persistent volumes that you mentioned which are NFS, iSCSI and Fiber Channel. Um, we would like to move those to CSI drivers and in fact there are already CSI implementations of them. 
Uh, someone reached out to me today to remind me that the NFS one doesn't work very well. Uh, but the idea is that it'll be community owned and it will be external. Uh, I'm not sure if we're going to automatically migrate those or just leave it optional to the end user to decide which one they want to use. Um, we need to figure that out. And then finally, the last set is local ephemeral volumes. This includes empty dir, secrets, config maps. Those are all basically very Kubernetes-specific volumes, and we're going to leave those in uh, entry because they're, it doesn't make sense to pull them out. Uh, let's do you and then you. Uh, you can start here because there's often uh, cloud providers uh, members here present, and they're focused on storage. Uh, and if not, we can uh, redirect you to one of this one of those uh, uh, SIGs. And I think you had a question. Ah, excellent question. Excellent question. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the design for that has been stalled for a sure. while. Uh, so let's repeat oh, the question. The question was, uh, what's the status on local uh, volume dynamic provisioning? Um, so, so maybe for folks who don't know, what is local volumes? Oh, and that's <laughs> it's quick. like another talk. But, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, basically, so we in Kubernetes, we have support for local persistent volumes which lets you expose um, in local disks on your host as a persistent volume. Um, and the question is related to, so right now we don't support dynamic provisioning. So the question is, what's the status on supporting dy dynamic provisioning? Um, it's definitely something on our roadmap and we're still kind of in the process of designing it. Um, we've hit a few design hurdles, um, but we're trying to go and you know, get unblocked and try to make forward progress. Yes. <laughs> yes. There. Um, yes, you can. So actually, someone I think someone from Rancher has written like a host path dynamic provisioner. Um, but the main the main challenge that the hurdle that we're trying to overcome right now is um, how to do capacity isolation and do capacity reporting of how much local storage you actually have available in your local storage pool. So that mechanism does not exist today in Kubernetes, so we would need to figure out how to add that. Yeah, it's not so much a challenge of the interface. It's more about actually going and implementing it and making it uh, work. Uh, let's go in the back. Shay. Uh, question is, what about replication? Any news about that? So replication, I think, is uh, a feature that I kind of treats similar to encryption, where right now it is an opaque parameter that a cluster admin can set on a storage class. So it's a property of a storage system uh, that gets exposed through a storage class. You can say, I want to enable replication, and I want it to be replicated to this other region, zone, whatever external place. Um, and then the storage system, after its provision, is responsible for doing that. Now, the next steps uh, are, are there things that we can do within Kubernetes to make Kubernetes aware that there is uh, a replicated version of this volume that exists somewhere else and make it uh, operate uh, more intelligently on that. The work that uh, Michelle and the rest of the SIG did with topology enables that uh, to a certain extent. Um, so basically, if, uh, if you implement topology correctly with your CSI driver, you can identify a volume as belonging to multiple zones, for example. And then the Kubernetes uh, scheduler will automatically figure out, oh, I, I can use either of these zones to uh, land, land the workload that uses this volume in. So that already exists today. Uh, but what doesn't exist yet is uh, kind of, if you want to use those replicated volumes for something like an active, active uh, HA solution. Kubernetes isn't really aware of that, so you need to handle that at an application layer. You need to like deploy two pods and make sure they're multi-attach capable, uh, and then like write your own code to be able to uh, switch between them or to uh, have some sort of service that'll uh, you know send traffic to either of them. I think there's work that we would like to do there longer term, um, but we haven't thought through the details of what that would look like uh, 
in the short term. I don't know if anybody else has anything they want to add to that. Uh, so we actually implement that in our CSI driver. So basically, uh, for Kubernetes, it's just one volume, but it's replicated. So your storage system can actually replicate that. So it's like there two underneath. So that's uh, possible right now. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, cloning is not quite replication, but like if you're interested, you should check out like Erin and John's proposal about like cloning. And uh, yeah, it's not you're gonna do active active PVCs, but. Uh, we would we would want more comments and reviews of the cloning proposal to take it forward as something we are planning to address in uh, next year. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, let's go you and then. Here. Assuming that the storage system is still compatible? Yeah, or, yeah, assuming that it's still data and you can move this data to that location. You just, like, say, host a system, mm -hmm. for, for example. Uh, like, if this was a sender, you would be doing a retype with migration again. Yeah. Um, do, do we have any plans for that? Or? So maybe, uh, Shang, you could talk about the current status uh, with snapshots and how you can use that, assuming that storage is consistent across the two locations and then future plans there, maybe. Yeah, so that's one possibility is you, you can use the snapshots. Then you can, uh, once you take snapshot from one backend, maybe the other backend can just uh, create a, a PVC from that snapshot. That's one possibility. And right. there's also uh, a topology feature that we are looking at adding to support the snapshot. So using that, then that's a possibility. Another thing is we actually had a proposal, the volume operation proposal that, that was drafted mm -hmm. earlier, that actually includes migration. Um, but we didn't uh, proceed with that. <coughs> so maybe you could, we could go back and uh, look at that and, again. And when you say migration, you, are you talking about some sort of live migration or? I'm not, I'm not talking live, uh, although maybe that's in the future. I'm more just moving data like, around. You, you have, you know, say, say you have uh, block data on this, on this side. You want to move an exact copy of that block data from this vendor device mm -hmm. to, say, a set yep. install. Like, yep. Yeah. Things. If, say this one's eventually going to go down for maintenance, and you need to move this workload over onto this new backend that's yep. not necessarily the same vendor. So what what I would like to do see in the long term future is building on top of what we did with snapshots. So if you see the way that snapshots are implemented today, the way that you use a snapshot is uh, on your PVC, your persistent volume claim. There is a new field called a data source that you can specify a snapshot as a data source. Um, so you can imagine that being extended to create general uh, external populators uh, where, for example, you could write something that knows that I am trying to import a snapshot of type EMC and uh, you know, put, it, put it into a, what are some other type of storage. Uh, and um, so we could extend that data source to be more generic and allow for CRDs. Uh, and then you could write your own importer and exporter. Uh, so the exporter would be triggered off of the snapshot. And then we have snapshot classes, which you could use to say, this is the target that I want to store this at. And then you could have a reverse import operation by creating a new PVC with a data source that points to a CRD. So that's kind of where I'm leaning towards this. But again, these are very early plans. And if you're interested in all, at, at all in working on that, uh, join us and help us kind of shake that out. Well, So, so that's yes. something so, that so. the cloning proposal already contains. <laughs> you, uh, there are people trying to clone PVs and also between zones, and they are trying also to introduce host-assisted cloning. So the storage system itself can clone a volume, and Kubernetes just yeah. watches that. Ideally, we do not want to get Kubernetes itself involved in the data path. Uh, yeah. As much as possible, we try to remain in the control path, if at all possible. Um, with so, the cloning proposal currently, I think we're still pushing it down to the storage layer to actually I don't know. do. I don't remember. Yeah. So. So I think we actually, uh, in, when we uh, add that cloning into uh, CSI, we actually said we don't want to support the host-based, host-assisted 
cloning, at least at this stage, right? So it's, it has to be storage uh, assisted. So, yeah. um, so I think, uh, if we want to change that in the future, maybe yeah. uh, it's we could do. Of course, nothing is final, but in general, we try to stay out of the data path as much as possible. It uh, reduces uh, uh, just the ability for us to scale and uh, increases the number of bugs and security issues that we have. Um, but great question. Join the community. We can talk about that more. Uh, and I think you had a good question. Yeah, so uh, we implemented uh, dynamic provisioning mm -hmm. of storage. Are there plans to kind of discontinue that API and also push over to CSR? The external provisioner? Yeah. Yep. Uh, so the question is, uh, they implemented what was called an external provisioner. Uh, and uh, what, are there any plans for migrating that? How does that work? Uh, is anybody here interested in answering that? Or <coughs> go for it. Well, we are not planning to remove this external provisioning interface, but we are going to suggest to move all the storage to CSI eventually. So we have, you have plenty of time. We are not removing the interface. We may deprecate it in the future, but it's distant future. Yeah, and Kubernetes deprecation policy applies, which means <laughs> you're safe to continue to use it, but uh, if you want any new functionality, uh, it'll come through CSI. Does, does your code play in the external provisioning repository, or is it outside? Like, is it in the Kubernetes ex no. provisional rep OK, OK, yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, please. <laughs> yeah, go for it. So when you show the, the 114 plans, right? yes. so it's uh, CSI features and stuff like this, and then you have yep. separate items about snapshots and clones. So yeah. I don't know. Uh, it is, in fact, part of CSI, and that's one of the carrots that we're using to get folks to switch over to CSI. <laughs> Yes. For uh, storage backends that support read write shared and uh, read write once, mm -hmm. is it sufficient for them to just say that if they support shared, they also support once, or do they have to provide exclusive gating and mm, Good question. <laughs> uh, Jan, do you want to take this one? Uh, yeah, I can. You want to repeat the uh, question in, for the audience? Well, the question was about uh, shared storage. If it should expose, as I understand it, in the PV, that their support just read write many, or they should also uh, support the read write once inside the PV, and the answer is yes. You should, in the PV, you should expose all the modes that the PV is capable of, including read, one, read only, for example. and. The PV binder matches the request from PVC with whatever the PV supports and gives it to the pod. Does it answer your question? He's asking if, um, he's asking if the, the actual storage backend has to enforce read, write. Oh. So uh, Kubernetes currently, like only for attachable volumes, we enforce like the like if if the mode the volume supports only read write once it could be attached only to one node but for <laughs> shared storage like for other volume types that don't support attachable interface we don't enforce it actually and even within attaches controller the interface that enforces this that okay uh, read write once volume will be attached only to one node it's kind of weak actually and if the if the control play, controller crashed and it started on some other node, there's a race condition that that it could allow a volume to be um, attached. At, at least it could try to attach to two nodes at once. So this is something like we don't strongly like enforce it at the moment, actually. Yeah. So short answer is. <laughs> So it is, uh, this is the way that Kubernetes kind of behaves today is it doesn't actually enforce these uh, uh, access modes. The access modes are used for binding and it's up to the, uh, the user to decide how they're gonna use it. So you could imagine a read write once volume that's bound and uh, if it doesn't actually implement attach, Kubernetes doesn't prevent you from actually using it multiple times. You can go and use it multiple times. Uh, the storage system will fail and only the first pod is going to be able to get started. Uh, the second one is going to remain pending because the storage system says, sorry, that's not available. So it is dependent on the storage system to actually enforce it. If the storage system doesn't enforce it, then Kubernetes isn't going to block it. Stronger guarantee has to come from the stronger guarantee has to come from storage system itself. We have tried to implement some kind of like, like by, in, by implementing dummy attached detached interface for iSCSI and fiber channel where we had some file corruption issues, but it's not 
really like strong guarantee. Any other questions? I heard about uh -huh. this uh, local st uh, storage persistent. Uh -huh. I'm just interested, would it move along with the product of all this is like the Ah, good question. Can you no, repeat the it question? Doesn't. <laughs> uh, the question was, uh, if you use local persistent volumes, if the pod goes to another node, does the storage move with it too? The answer is no. Um, actually, once you bind your pod to a PVC that uses a local volume, your pod always gets scheduled to the same node. Even if that node dies and disappears, your pod will try to be scheduled to that node, and if your node's not there, then your pod can't get scheduled. Yeah, if you use local storage, you must be aware that you have reduced reliability and uh, that your application can tolerate failures. Uh, let's do you, and then we can go back to you. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. So any thoughts on the storage QoS specification? Uh, so the question is, any thoughts on storage QoS in, I'm assuming, CSI? Yeah. Anybody want to take that? Well, I haven't, I haven't seen any proposals, but basically, uh, did you have anything specific in mind? Yeah, it's, I mean, like the, the noisy neighbor problem. I, I think you can actually do that just using the, the, the storage class. You should be able to do that, right? You just set different levels of uh, QoS, and then you can use different storage class that, that well, should do so, it. So in, uh, in Kubernetes today, uh, the scheduler kind of schedules for CPU memory and possibly storage capacity and some of the attributes for storage, like uh, topology. We don't really uh, schedule based on I.O. or uh, uh, things like that. Uh, we don't have any immediate plans to make Kubernetes more aware. Um, Michelle, maybe you can. Um, so in the scheduler itself, there's a new feature. I think it's beta <coughs> for pod priority. So you can give your pods um, different priorities, and that will schedule them appropriately. And, and it might evict. If, and yeah, data. if it schedules, um, um, if, if you schedule a high priority pod and there's no room for it, it's going to try to kick out a lower priority pod to make room. Yes? Uh, are, are there any tests for the overall storage scalability within mm -hmm. Kubernetes? I think it was a comment yesterday from the San Diego Security Center about the attempt of Kubernetes to change your every file in the <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So is it something that's being considered? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Yeah, Scalability so plans are in the in the works, <laughs> just like all our two hundred seventy yeah. bugs. So. So uh, I mean, immediate plans are to get better metrics uh, around scalability. Um, so in the coming quarter, we want to uh, establish those and start uh, exporting them as part of the scalability tests that we run. Uh, Kubernetes, I think, uh, runs multi-thousand node clusters uh, at the moment, but those are all stateless pods that are being tested in that cluster. So we want to start introducing uh, stateful pods into those tests, uh, collect the metrics and figure out where the bottlenecks are, and then uh, add uh, profiling to figure out, uh, you know, debug that further, uh, and then figure out what we need to do to improve scalability once we understand what the current state is. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, oh, the so next talk if you, is lunch. That's right. If you have any other questions, feel free to grab any of us, and uh, we'll see you afterwards. Thank you.